I don't know if you ever had uh, a nickname when you were growing up. Maybe some of you guys did, but when I was in like junior high, middle school, I used to play some dodgeball. That was a great game, by the way. And um, when I would get going, they used to call me Richie Rampage. And, and the reason why they called me this was because I started to become dominant. I got so competitive that I would go on this rampage. I was catching balls, putting people out. It, it was amazing. But ultimately, the reason why they gave me the nickname was because that was their perception of me in that moment. That's what nicknames are all about, ultimately. Nicknames tell us how people oftentimes see us. And Jesus, he had lots of different nicknames. He was confusing and perplexing to the people of the day. And there was one nickname that has always, always intrigued me the most. They called Jesus the friend of sinners. You see, when Jesus was on the earth, he was always hanging out with people that supposedly society said he shouldn't be hanging out with. He was a man of God. What was he doing with tax collectors and criminals and prostitutes? Why was he with so many bad people? I wrote this book, Friend of Sinners, because I think many times today, so many people, they have the wrong definition of what it means to be a sinner. Many people think that being a sinner means that you're a bad person. But really, being a sinner is our identity before we meet Jesus. And really, Jesus' mission was to be the friend of sinners. What does that mean? It means he didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And all of us, every one of us, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, meaning all of us, whether we think we're good or we know that we're bad, all of us have fallen short and all of us fall into the category of being a sinner. Yet I believe there's hope in this because truthfully, God came to save sinners, which all of us are. And as we discover his mission, it gives us a mission. Jesus, he's the friend of sinners. And the more you follow him, you'll discover that you too are called to be a friend of sinners. And so I wrote this book, Friend of Sinners, Why Jesus Cares More About Relationship Than Perfection. And today I've got some of my friends here. By the way, you guys all look really, really good. And I'm just going to read chapter one, if that's okay. And some of you guys, you've got books, and so we're going to follow along together. But uh, chapter one, uh, first chapter is called Missed Message. And I'm going to begin reading, and you can listen along, or you can follow along if you've got the book right there. Chapter one, Missed Message. A few years ago, my wife, Dawn Cherie, surprised me with a special gift for my 27th birthday. Now, let me preface this story by mentioning that Dawn Cherie loves surprises, She likes being surprised, but she especially loves planning surprises for others. I, on the other hand, hate being surprised. Down deep, I have a compulsive desire to be in control. I like to have clear plans, so surprises aren't really my thing. Anyway, Dawn Shree came home from work and handed me a box. Babe, I've got you the best gift. She was clearly excited. I said, what'd you wrap up? Yourself, girl? She ignored me, which is one of her spiritual gifts. Open up the box. You're going to love it. I unwrapped the box and opened it. Inside was a piece of paper she had designed and printed. It said, in two weeks, I'm taking you to the Kings of Leon concert at the Bank Atlantic Center. I was pumped. They're one of our favorite bands, and I couldn't wait to see them live. Finally, a surprise I could get excited about. For the next two weeks, we did what people do when they are anticipating something. We talked about it every day. 11 more days until the Kings. We told our friends about it, and we insisted they pretend to be excited for us. We sang their songs. You know that I could use somebody. That's pretty good. That's actually pretty good right there. (laughs) Finally, the day arrived. Don had carefully crafted and curated the evening. She took me to our favorite Mexican restaurant for a pre-concert dinner date. We had decided to skip the opening act, and she had everything timed perfectly so we could go straight from our romantic dinner to the arena, just in time for the headliner. Dinner was magical. We laughed and enjoyed each other's company over tacos, salsa, and chips. When 8 p.m. rolled around, we knew we had to get going to make it on time. On the drive to the venue, we blasted Kings of Leon songs on the stereo and sang every lyric at the top of our lungs. We were flirting with each other. There was so much love in the air. This was going to be the most amazing evening ever. Our expectations had reached epic heights, and we exited the freeway and approached the parking lot at the Bank Atlantic Center. To our surprise, the parking lot was deserted. My first thought was, wow, I thought this band had a bigger following than this. Dontre said, I think something's wrong. No, this is going to be great. I'm not going to give up easily. Let's park the car and go in. 
We got out of the car, walked all the way up to the Bank Atlantic Center doors, and our fears were confirmed. Nobody was there. The lobby was abandoned, the doors were locked, and the lights were off. So I said, babe, let me see those tickets. Don Shrew is full of attitude. I know what they say. Concert at 7.30 p.m. at the Bank Atlantic Center. Girl, just let me look at the tickets. She handed me the tickets. I read them. And then I nearly yelled, they don't say Bank Atlantic Center. They say Bank United Center. We're in Fort Lauderdale, and the concert is in Coral Gables. That's an hour away. We'll never make it in time. Dawn Shree started to cry. This is the worst surprise ever, she whispered. I ruined everything. I replied, quit crying. You can't cry on my birthday. <laughs> this is my party. <laughs> Actually, I, I didn't say that. I'm not that insensitive. I told her how much I appreciated her efforts. I think I, I lied about loving her surprises. Obviously, we missed the concert that night, and we still haven't seen the band live, but at least it was a memorable night, just for all the wrong reasons. We ended up laughing and making a memory out of it. To this day, it's one of our favorite stories to tell other couples. Have you ever missed the message in, this, in something? Have you ever overlooked the main point? Bank Atlantic Center, Bank United Center. They sound so similar, yet they are so different. For Don Shree and me, missing the message only resulted in missing a concert. But when it comes to following Jesus, the consequences are much more significant. You see, Jesus came to this earth with a specific message. His teachings, his miracles, his reactions to people, and his death and resurrection all communicate one main point. Yet it's far too easy to miss it. This can happen to the best of us, and probably has. Even well-intentioned, good-hearted, and spiritually-minded people can overlook it. We might have a portion of the message. We might have a version of the message. But we miss the main theme. The problem is, if we miss his message long enough, we'll end up somewhere God never intended us to be. And we won't like the result. I find many people are spiritually confused and worn out. Not because Christianity is hard or God is a tyrant, but because they've missed what Jesus came to say. Some people think Jesus came to preach about good works. They think the goal of his life was to get us to talk better, act better, be better. Following Jesus, therefore, is about behavioral change. It's about fixing yourself and those around you, not necessarily in that order. Others think Jesus came to establish a holier-than-thou country club religion. His goal was that a bunch of abnormally self-disciplined and equally self-righteous people would get together, call themselves the church, and spend their days dispensing judgment against the sinful world. Still, others think Jesus was merely a philosopher, he was a good man, an inspiring teacher. He didn't deserve what happened to him. Too bad he ticked off the establishment, they say sadly. It always happens. Only the good die young. Some think Jesus' life was a protest against evil. His martyrdom was his message. His life and death were a legacy and an inspiration, but nothing more. The list of opinions goes on. Some people say he was a rebel, a zealot who wanted to overthrow the Roman Empire and failed. Some say he was an apocalyptic prophet who believed and preached the end of the world was imminent. Others say he was insane or a con man or a liar. The more I read the stories about Jesus and listen to his words, the more convinced I am those views and others like them fall short. Jesus didn't come simply for behavior modification. He, came to create a, he didn't come to create a religious club or a clique. He didn't come merely as a philosopher or a martyr or life coach. Jesus' message is far more simple, yet far more powerful than any of those concepts. Exploring who Jesus is and why he came is the central question of this book. I don't want to miss what Jesus came to say. And I'm sure you don't either. If he is who he said he was, and he said he was God, then it's only logical we make sure we get his message straight. What was he trying to tell us when he spent three and a half years roaming a tiny country in the Middle East? Why did he heal people, forgive people, call people to follow him? Why did he die and rise again? And based on all that, how should we live our lives today, 2,000 years later? Maybe you aren't too sure about Jesus claimed to be God. In your mind, the jury is still out whether his words and teachings still carry weight in your life. That's okay. That doesn't bother me a bit. We're all on the journey of getting to know God, life, and ourselves. None of us 
have all the answers, least of all me. But even if you aren't sure where you stand on Jesus or the Bible, most of us would agree that for some reason, Jesus lived in uniquely impacting life. For some reason, his birth split human chrono chronology in half. For some reason, his teachings and his story resonate in the human heart. For some reason, millions of people from every nation in every century attribute positive changes in their lives to him. For some reason, people pray in his name and time and time again report answers to their prayers. For some reason, his teachings and principles are so integrated into our thinking that we often quote him and don't even know it. So what was his message? And who is it for? The answer might surprise you, and it may impact your life forever. I like this next section. We're going to go into this part here where we start to look at one of the Gospels, and I subtitled it, Jesus and the Gangster. I think that's kind of cool. So anyways, okay, sorry. <laughs> to, to answer the question, I want to look at a little story in the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are full of stories meant to paint a picture of Jesus. They present in gritty, compelling detail a man consumed with a message. One of the most revealing stories is how Matthew, a man formerly known as Levi, encountered Jesus. This brief story reveals much about Jesus' message and mission. Now, before I jump into the story, you might be wondering why this guy had two names. One of my favorite movies growing up was called Three Ninjas. Justin, you don't, you're too young for Three Ninjas, but you should go back and watch it. It's very good. Um, the plot line revolved around three kids whose grandfather was a ninja. See, you're already, you're already engaged. Look at it. He's already there. Um, he trained them and gave them ninja names. Samuel, Jeffrey, and Michael became Rocky, Colt, and Tum Tum. I'm not sure why the last one got such a, a lame name, but those kids were amazing. They could beat up grown adults. I always wanted a ninja name. Now, Matthew was clearly not a ninja, but his occupation did require a non-Hebrew name. He had been born Levi, a Jew. And at some point, however, he became known by a Greek name, Matthew. His name and his identity, just like the three ninjas, were inextricably intertwined. Uh, there was an important reason for that, which I'll get to in a bit. Later in life, Matthew turned out to be an incredible guy. He was one of Jesus' 12 disciples and one of the authors of the New Testament. He wrote the gospel that bears his name, which is why most of us remember him for it. Much earlier, though, before he met Jesus, he was not a nice person. Actually, that, that's an understatement. Matthew was the quintessential bad guy. He wasn't just the run-of-the-mill bad. He was an outright criminal. He was blatantly and intentionally and famously bad. He was the kind of person parents warned their kids about and crossed the street to avoid. Before he met Jesus, Matthew was a tax collector. Now, you probably didn't gasp or blush when you read that, but anyone living in that day and culture would have. Back then, a tax collector wasn't the robe-wearing equivalent of an IRS employee. He was more like a mafia boss or a gangster. Matthew, the tax collector, was not a man to be trifled with. He put the original in OG. He was like all three Godfather movies in one person. At the time, Rome was the supreme world's superpower. And Israel was one of the lands they had conquered. The Roman army was notoriously brutal and barbaric. Numerous historical accounts record Rome sacking cities. They would often kill many of the men, rape the women, and enslave the children. History recounts instances when the army lined the streets with people on crosses so anyone who entered would know the force and power of the Roman kingdom. After conquering a new territory, the Roman government would impose taxes on the local subjects. That's where Matthew came in. His job was to collect taxes from his own people to give to Rome. In other words, he betrayed his people for a paycheck. And here's the kicker. Tax collectors were required to turn in a certain amount of money to Rome, but they could keep anything they collected above that. They were allowed, even expected, to extort money from their own people to line their pockets. They were traitors, thieves, and bullies. It's no wonder they were hated so fiercely by their own people. This was the reason Matthew went by his Greek name. Greek was the language of the day, so Levi would not have been the most culturally acceptable name to the Romans. Matthew had been born into the nation of Israel, God's chosen people, but he didn't care about that. He cared about money, power, and notoriety. So instead of being Levi, the Jew, he took on a new identity, Matthew, the tax collector, 
Matthew, the traitor. Matthew, the extortionist. By working for Rome, Matthew had turned his back on his Jewish heritage. To put this in context, context, imagine that a foreign power has attacked your country. First, they kill, rape, imprison, or enslave your family and friends. Then they begin to rule your life with an iron fist. To top it off, they impose a suffocating tax, and to collect the tax, they hire your neighbor. Suddenly, the guy you used to grill steaks with in your backyard is your enemy. Now he uses everything he knows about you against you. With the full backing of the conquering nation, he takes what he wants from you and your loved ones. Eventually, you can hardly feed your kids, and he has his Ferrari parked in his driveway. You tell me, is that a good person? Is that someone you want to hang with? Is that someone you're excited about going to church with? Is that someone you would trust with anything you value? Me neither. That's why it's so startling that Jesus made friends with people like Matthew. He didn't just talk to them. He loved them. He called them. He changed them. And he made them a part of his story. It's unbelievable. Here's how Matthew himself described his encounter with Jesus. Like a true godfather, he referred to himself in third person. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, They asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Matthew 9, 9, uh, Matthew 9, uh, verse 9 through 13. Notice that Jesus didn't give Matthew, I I love this concept, right, by the way. Notice that Jesus didn't give Matthew an application to fill out. This is big. He didn't put him on probation for three months. He didn't make him a pinky promise to never extort money again. He didn't even lead him in the sinner's prayer. Jesus simply said, follow me and be my disciple. Really, Jesus? People must have been thinking, what qualifies this gangster to be your disciple? In their minds, being Jewish was the only chance for salvation. Matthew, the wannabe Roman, was a textbook sinner, the epitome of evil, a prime example of the people the Messiah would one day come to judge. Yet Jesus called him and Matthew followed just like that. You see, we read it so quickly and casually sometimes, but when you stop to consider who this man was, the implications are staggering. Just look at the reactions of people back then. Why does your teacher eat with such scum, they asked? That's probably the sanitized PG-rated version of what they actually said. Today, if a celebrity or high-profile person talks about Jesus, there is often instant pushback from religious people. What could he know about Jesus? Have you seen his music videos? Plus, he's on his third marriage, and everyone he knows does drugs. He can't possibly know God. Often, they even quote Bible verses that appear to back up their judgmental stance, verses about fruit, about holiness, and usually about hell. I'm certainly not contradicting those verses, and I understand the need for holiness. My full-time job is helping people understand how to apply the Bible to their lives. After all, so the existence, uh, so the existence of sin is job security— I'm kidding, but my point is serious. If we truly want to follow Jesus, then we have to understand his message and his heart. Jesus sought out and befriended a known criminal. Then he named him one of his core group of followers. If that doesn't fit in our paradigm, then we need a new paradigm. See, the message, let's be honest. Sometimes we make it too difficult for people to follow Jesus. We forget faith is a journey. And on that journey, we are all in different places. We can't expect that a person who is just beginning to follow Jesus will have the faith, actions, or vocabulary of someone who has been in relation with Jesus for years. God certainly doesn't. A while back, someone came up to me at church after I finished preaching, and he had just recently started attending, and he was clearly excited about what he had heard that night. 
He loudly exclaimed, that was effing amazing, man. I effing love your preaching, except he didn't censor himself. It was the best compliment ever. I loved it. My favorite part was that he didn't realize what he was doing. Why should he? He didn't know you don't typically use the F word in church. All he knew was that God was real and he was changing his world. See, religion tends to look for our outward signs that we are qualified to follow God. But Jesus shatters that paradigm time and time again. He doesn't wait for us to clean ourselves up or renounce our lifestyles. He finds us where we are and calls us to follow him. No application or qualifications needed. That's why I think Matthew's story is such a perfect illustration of Jesus' message. So, what was Jesus' message? It wasn't that good people go to heaven, and it wasn't that bad people will be judged. Those are cheap imitations of his message. Jesus' message was grace. It was salvation for all who believe in him. It was mercy and compassion and forgiveness for all who would put their faith in him. And I'll even go further. Jesus was the personification and the embodiment of grace. In other words, Jesus himself is the message. Jesus is the purpose and the point. The message message isn't mere dogma or doctrine. It isn't behavioral change. The message is that no matter who you are or how badly you've messed up, grace and forgiveness are available in Jesus. That's why Jesus came to earth in physical, tangible, human form. He came not to just tell us about grace, but to literally be grace for over 33 years. His life was his message, and his message gives life. The more we follow Jesus, the more we find our lives defined and transformed by the love and grace of God. Jesus' life is the message of grace. It's a message of unconditional and unending acceptance by God. Based on, his grace and received, based on his grace and received through faith in Jesus, I've discovered that it's one thing to agree with grace or even recite verses about grace, but it's another, another to truly understand it and live it. Honestly, that's where we tend to miss the message the most. We listen to grace on Sunday and then live with guilt, law, and condemnation Monday through Saturday. Who Jesus is and why he came to earth is the best news the world has ever heard. It's not hard news, bad news, complicated news, or frightening news. It's good news. The message of Jesus is one of hope, of joy, of peace, of freedom. When Jesus is our message, we realize that anyone and everyone is a candidate to be called by God. Rather than being stuck on people's current behavior, we recognize we are all equally qualified, or better said, equally unqualified to be followers and disciples. Matthew understood this about Jesus. When he threw a party for Jesus, the guest list consisted of many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. This was not the typical squad of a Jewish teacher. I can just imagine Matthew calling all his friends. You've got to meet this Jesus guy. He accepted me. He believed in me. He loved me. He delivered me. He changed me. He wanted them all to meet Jesus. Christians often ask me how I'm able to be friends with certain people who don't adhere to the definition of a Christian lifestyle. It's simple. I usually reply, because Jesus was. Some of them get it, but some of them counter, a bit defensively. Sure, Jesus hung out with people, but only to save them. They repented and followed him. Not true, I'll say. Many did, but many didn't. When it comes to faith, everyone is on their own journey but they still need friends along the way. In Matthew's narrative, we don't read that the guests had to sit through a sermon to meet Jesus. All we see is that they had dinner and drinks together. We don't know what he said, but we do know that he sought them out, he spent time with them, and he developed a relationship with them. We tend to measure out our love based on what we'll get back. We will spend time with people and love them as long as there is hope they'll change. Not Jesus. He didn't write off anyone. He didn't consider it a waste of time to invest in people who might, not never, who might never respond. Friendship wasn't a means to an end, but an end in itself. 
Has it ever occurred to you that Jesus is God? He knew who would ultimately reject him or receive him. He healed hands that would hurt people. He restored feet that would run back into sin. He opened eyes that would lust. Why? Because Jesus loves everyone. He loves deeply and unconditionally. Jesus stays consistent even when we are inconsistent. He loves even when we hate and he's faithful even when we're faithless. The Jesus message is not one of religion, but of relationship. Jesus goes to the party, not to let the party get into him, but to get into the party because he loved the partiers. <laughs> he went to show God's love to people who might not want it or believe it or accept it, at least for now. Ultimately, who is the judge of what is worth it? Not us, that's for sure. Only God knows what is happening and people's hearts. This last section is one of these kind of moments that I'm hoping as readers read it that they discover Jesus, but as we're kind of on this journey that we look at ourselves, and I'm going to talk a little bit personally in this last part here in chapter one about myself, and I just subtitled it Finding the Pharisee Within, because I ultimately think that we've all got Pharisees inside of us, even if we know about grace and know his message. Um, it, it is very difficult for religious people to be friends of sinners because religion seeks to control, to impress, and to conform. Religion, apart from relationship, is more concerned about outward behavior than inward change. It values performance and perfection. The Pharisees were the standard of holiness in Jesus' day. They were also, at least in general, arrogant and mean. Instead of showing mercy and leading people to God, they condemned and discouraged people. Jesus regularly called them out for their judgmental attitudes, usually using terms like blind fools, snakes, and hypocrites. No wonder they weren't fans. The crazy thing is, they didn't mean to be that way. They thought they were pleasing God. They were working hard to eradicate sin in themselves and in the people around them. Unfortunately, they were missing the message of Jesus entirely. The Pharisees were frustrated with Jesus because he was supposed to be a rabbi, and yet he hung out with heathens. Criminals, really, they thought the point was to avoid sin, yet Jesus had a habit of seeking out sinners. So they started asking the questions, why are you, uh, why are you a friend to such terrible, awful sinners? Jesus' answer was brilliant, but, it often, but it's often misinterpreted. He replied, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now, if you've been around church for a while, you've probably heard this quote. It's recorded in the other Gospels as well. I think most people would agree that this is noble, compassionate, altruistic sentiment. My guess is even the Pharisees appreciated it. I think it appeased their concerns. They probably thought to themselves, oh, that makes sense. He's trying to help those poor, misguided souls. He wants to show them their wrongs so they can turn their behavior around. Just like us, a good person helping bad people be better. But they miss the point completely. And honestly, we often do too. Apart from Jesus, there is no such thing as a good person. There is no distinction, distinction between righteous people and unrighteous people, or between healthy people and sick people. Without the grace of Jesus, there is only one category. Sinner, sick, unrighteous, dead to be exact. Jesus was trying to communicate his message but many people missed it. He was saying that he came to save everyone, but only those who recognize their need for salvation will be saved. I can just picture these Pharisees walking away satisfied with his answer, maybe even more arrogant than when they came. They probably felt justified in their self-proclaimed goodness, confident they were in a separate category from sick and sinners. When we miss the Jesus message, we become blinded by our good works, religion, and self-effort. We think there are areas in our lives that are righteous apart from grace. The gospel of Jesus doesn't lead to arrogance of self. It leads to acquiescence to Jesus. It leads to humility and to dependence on God. It's so easy to judge the Pharisees. They seem like fictitious Disney characters to us. I always imagine Jafar from Aladdin every time I read the word Pharisee. And yet from time to time, I think there's a Pharisee inside each of us. I know there is in me. 
I recognize his selfish ways whenever I think I'm better than someone, when I compare my sin to someone else's sin, when I think my morality impresses God, or when I think my struggle isn't as dirty to God as another person's struggle. Whenever I think I'm any different from Levi, the tax collector, I'm in danger of missing the Jesus message. His message isn't a political message. It isn't a social justice message. It isn't an economic message. It isn't a gender rights message. It isn't an environmental message. The Jesus message is that we are all born sick, but Jesus came to heal us. We are sinners, but he came to call us to repentance. In him, there is grace, there is wholeness, and there is life. The Apostle Paul described a visit he made to the Corinthian church this way. I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy. I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First Jesus and who he is, then Jesus and what he did. Jesus crucified. In other words, everything Paul had preached to them could be summed up in Jesus and his work on the cross. That is what matters That is all that is needed. When it comes to following Jesus, especially in the context of church and other people who are also Christians, it's so easy to mix our message. Why? Because for humans, grace is not the default. We have to learn how to live that way. Our default mode is Pharisee. It's to rate, rank, and judge people based on outward actions. Grace levels the playing field, though. Grace reminds us that we are all equally bad. We are all tax collectors, so to speak. But here's the good news. We are all friends of Jesus. If he's the friend of sinners, and if we are sinners, then he is our friend, not because we earned it, not because we even asked for it, but because God loves the world and he sent his son, Jesus, to save the world. Outward actions and changed lifestyles are important. Sin hurts us, after all. It robs us of our humanity and strips us of our dignity. We were created to live better than that. Holiness, however, is the result of salvation, not the road to it. Better behavior is a byproduct of the work of Jesus and not even the most important one. Love, peace, joy, freedom, and the other internal transformations are far more significant than dropping less F-bombs or kicking a cocaine habit. But when we miss the message, we start to think actions and behavior are the goal. We can't afford to get wrapped up in the effects. We can't get the order reversed. We must be consumed with the cause and the goal of life itself, Jesus. Getting ourselves or others to do things for Jesus is never the goal. The goal is knowing Jesus. It is putting our faith in what he did for us on the cross. It is returning to God, the creator of our souls, and finding our home in him. When we meet Jesus, of course, we will experience genuine life change. Matthew left everything to follow Jesus. This is what happens with the gospel. The reasonable response to a true encounter with Jesus is inner and outer transformation. Your priorities change. Your values change. Your social circles change. Even though meeting Jesus results in massive life change, the emphasis is not on how hard we must work to accomplish that change. The emphasis is on Jesus. When we follow him, we find ourselves taking steps and making decisions we probably never would have dared attempt on our own. I can think back to a couple of times in my teenage years when I had a clear personal encounter with Jesus. I knew he was real. I knew he was speaking to me and I knew I wanted to respond. Those were life altering moments. I remember praying passionately, Jesus, take all of me. Where you call me, I will go. Everything I have is yours. Ask me anything, Jesus. I'm yours. It's easy to pray those prayers as a teenager because you don't have much to lose. Even spending your life on the mission field in Africa seems like an upgrade from sharing a room with your younger brother. The older we get, though, the more cautious we tend to be. Not so with the message of Jesus. It creates a boldness like nothing else. Matthew, the tax collector, had never been to church or seminary, but he had one encounter with Jesus and immediately left his lifestyle behind and charged full speed toward the things of God. Following Jesus doesn't lead to a safer living. It leads to risk, sacrifice, and change. Yet it's the most satisfying life imaginable. 
When we value friendship with Jesus first, rather than behavior, and when we recognize that he is our friend because he wants to be, not because we deserve it, everything changes. This is the power of understanding the message of Jesus. We will find ourselves growing and changing from the inside out. Suddenly, life looks different. Depression is no match for our joy. Addictions are not our identities. Temptations can be overcome. Sin holds no power. Victory is within reach. The future is full of potential. Who would you be in Matthew's story? Saint or sinner? Pharisee or friend? Holier than thou or wholly messed up? Regardless of who you are or what you've done, the heart of God is the same. He loves you right now, right here, just as you are. Like Matthew, Jesus is your friend. He is calling you to know him, to rest in him, and to follow him. Will you let him? <clears throat> That's chapter one. So, uh, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So grateful for you guys hanging out with me, and obviously there's quite a few more chapters there that you can read along, but also thank you so much for joining us, and uh, if you don't have the book already, grab it, Friend of Sinners. I think it's going to be an encouragement to you. I think you're going to discover more about Jesus, but also discover more about how you should behave, more about how you should respond, more about how you should, too, be a friend to sinners. We love you guys. Thanks so much.